Well, I remind you that we are talking about uh, internal interactions and, uh, uh, well, today we will learn how, how the interactions actually are created within substances. Uh, we discuss, uh, I introduced so far, concept of stress, which describes interaction uh, within, a, within a substance, within a body. And uh, um, I mentioned already that, uh, that uh, this internal interaction is somehow related to this, what, what will happen with the substance, with the deformation of the substance. So we introduce also a physical quantity uh, which describes that deformation. What do we call this quantity? Which quantity describes interaction inside the substance? Stress, correct? And substance which describes the formation is called strain, correct? Uh, stress and strain are related. Now, they are so much related that in a common language, actually, we even confuse them uh, yeah, because we borrow these uh, words to, to, uh, to talk about uh, emotional states uh, of, a, of a person. And uh, uh, <coughs> very often we say that somebody is uh, under stress or that the person has strenuous life. Um, now, in physics, uh, stress and strain are related by a law which was, uh, was not actually introduced by Hooke. He introduced a simpler version of that law. Uh, however, when we introduced the uh, uh, concept of stress and strain, we could generalize that, that law which was introduced by Hooke, and therefore we still refer to it as Hooke's law. And it's Hooke's law says that stress and strain are proportional to each other. However, they are proportional in a very complicated way. Um, I recall that if we think about uh, stress, we have six independent parameters which describe uh, stress. We have also six numbers, which independent numbers, which uh, describe strain. In general, uh, from the definition, actually, we have nine of each. Uh, but uh, when the object, when, when the material, when substance is, uh, well, in equilibrium, uh, then uh, uh, certain uh, components of, str of stress have to be equal and certain components of strain have to be equal uh, to each other. All right, so <coughs> in the most uh, general uh, way for which, for, uh, for which you under should understand a notation, I could write uh, the relationship between, between stress and strain in su by such a formula. So it says that ijth component of stress is equal to sum of, uh, well, it's proportional to all components of strain. And here we have a sum. Now we will, uh, in our material, I mean, this is what you will actually uh, study more thoroughly in advanced classes. In this class, in our material, we will only limit ourselves to simpler uh, situations, but in general, something like this can happen. Uh, well, what, what it means, for example, it, it means that uh, if I squeeze, let's say, object from sides, there's, there, it will affect a vertical component of interactions. This is what that, what that relationship says. We will talk only about the situation that in order to have interactions in vertical directions, we have to squeeze in vertical directions or stretch in vertical directions. But, but we can squeeze from any, from any directions and it can affect interactions along any axis. Do you understand me? All right. Uh, <coughs> you will study this late, later on in other classes. Uh, uh, well, and because, so, so the relation, this relation actually is a tensor relationship. Stress is a tensor and strain is a tensor. And components of, of, uh, of uh, uh, stress and strain are related by this for, uh, tensor of the fourth rank. It has a lot of numbers, yeah, six times six, 
36 numbers actually relate stress with, with strain in general. Uh, well, uh, in physics or in science, actually, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of relationships be where every component depends on every other comp on, of one quantity depends on all components of another quantity. Uh, so uh, sooner or later, you will actually learn how to uh, use uh, uh, an abbreviated notation and uh, write it in a tensor form. So here uh, we have a, tensor, a stress tensor, here we have strain tensor, and coefficients, uh, which are also a tensor. So this is abbreviated form of really this expression. You should understand this product as that sum of products. Uh, all right, the proportionality uh, uh, tensor, uh, this tensor is called modulus tensor. And uh, all those numbers, will ref we will refer to all those numbers as moduli, various, various moduli. All right, how about if we take a look now at a simple case uh, in which uh, uh, we stretch we stretch an object vertically. Um, when we stretch the, the object vertically, we uh, say that we produce tension in that object. Tension is a name for a particular component of stress. Stress is really tension. So although I know that you use the word tension, uh, although uh, e uh, substituting it for a particular force uh, properly, you should call it not tension, but tensile force. When we were talking about hanging objects, for example, on, a, on ropes, that, that rope did not exert tension because tension was a stress state in the rope. This is what tension really is. Now, when tension is created in a rope, the rope exerts a tensile force force on something else. Now, obviously, in order to produce that tension, that something else had, had to stretch that, that, uh, that rope. So, so new, you see here Newton's third law in action. You couldn't, the rope could not exert a force on anything unless something was exerting a force on, on that rope. And <coughs> more than that, in order to produce tension, if I, if I have a certain object, the forces have to be applied on both sides. You cannot uh, stretch on one side and, uh, and have tension. I mean, actually, I'm, I'm saying it uh, kind of uh, not right. Uh, yeah, because <coughs> in case of tension, I should, I should think about a, a tiny slice uh, of, of an object and recognize that that slice is being stretched. So, for example, if I hold it this way, and now look at that uh, blue cap. Uh, how about if I change? Oh, this one is better. Red cap. Yeah, so, so now, tension at this point is caused not by the force which I apply over here, but it is, uh, this cap is pulled up by the blue pen and pulled down by the green uh, pen. Do you see that? And and if I take, if, con if I consider that this uh, slice is tiny, it's a differential slice, then mass of the slice is zero. So the two forces have to be opposite to each other. Force exerted by the blue pen and force exerted by the uh, green pen are opposite to each other. One is pulling, yeah, so one is pulling up, one is, uh, one is pulling up, one is pulling down, and we have tension in the cap. Now that if I hold it like that, tension is not uniformly distributed. Can you see that? Yeah, so how about if you have a conversation and compare where tension is greater, at the black cup or blue cup? Talk to each other, why? Anybody has an idea 
and would like to, to share it with, with somebody else. Would you like to do that? No? How about you? Would you like to? Who would like to do that? Okay, JD, thanks. <coughs> Not tension force, tension. Okay. Let's talk about tension. Okay, I felt the tension would be greater at the blue cap because uh, the amount of force pulling down would be greater than the weight of the remaining. Who agrees with, with JD? Those of you who agree, you are right, right? Because over here, what is, what, what is uh, pulling downward is, are these three objects. Now, how, with, what, what is the magnitude of the force? exerted by those three objects at the bottom. Their weight. It's equal to their weight, correct. Yeah, because these three objects are in balance. It means that the cap has to apply a force. I mean, we can recognize there are only two forces, right? Tensile force over here and gravitational force. So they have to add up to zero, which means that the blue cap pulls on this with a force equal to the weight, which means that uh, uh, I mean, opposite to the weight, which means that these two, these three, pull the uh, uh, blue cap with a force equal to their uh, their weight. Uh, all right. Now, uh, <coughs> where's the second force then? The one which stretches it. Well, the cap is in equilibrium. It is being pulled down by those three. <coughs> Let's say, I mean, that this is a slice of negligible mass, so gravitational force. I can assume that it's zero. Well, since it is in equilibrium, the green cap, the uh, green pen has to pull it also with a <coughs> force opposite to that weight. So the blue cap is being stretched up and down with the forces equal in magnitude to the weight of those three. Uh, all right. Now, <coughs> how that stress is actually created? in the object. Well, it happens only when the object is deformed. We have to stretch it. Now, in the case of a, of a cap on those pens, the uh, strain is so tiny that we cannot see it. But if we performed accurate measurements, uh, using, for example, a process of interference and see by how much the bottom moved, it Th these four pens are longer when I hold them that way than if I hold them that way. Up. <coughs> um, all right. So now let's say that if we apply those two opposite forces on, and uh, I wrote that these are differential forces, which means that I don't stretch it too much. Because if I stretch it too much, Hooke's law actually fails. Uh, well, by applying those two forces, we will stretch, which means that the object will become a little bit longer. And uh, well, let's now take a look at the relationship between stress and strain. So how about if we introduce this coordinate system? So I put x uh, toward us, y to the right, and z up. So which components of stress and strain are non-zero? Uh, remember that uh, components of stress and strain are not x, y, and z. They are all, they have all double indices. Which one? I can't hear you. Shout, Z, Z, correct. The Z, Z components are not zero. Yeah, they are exerted, the, this force is exerted on a, f a, a wall facing Z direction, and the force itself is in Z direction. So it is a Z, Z component, correct. All right. So uh, Hooke's law for this Z, Z component will say that ZZ component of stress is proportional to ZZ component of strain. That coefficient of the uh, 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 modulus uh, tensor is called Young's modulus. So stress and strain are proportional, and the proportionality coefficient is Young's modulus. Uh, now, 
let's use the definition of ZZ, uh, 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 ZZ component of stress and ZZ component of strain and relate it to the force. Uh, to the force and, and to the change in length of the object. So by definition, ZZ component of stress is the force applied to the surface divided by the surface, by the area of that surface. So uh, this force divided by area, cross-sectional area of this rod gives me ZZ component of stress. Now ZZ component of strain was uh, by how much relatively what was the elongation. Uh, so it is relative change of the length. So it is change of length divided by the total length of that, of that rod. And uh, I know that people uh, often ask, uh, should it be uh, initial length or final length? It does not matter. Because when you have a differential, if you add differential to that length, you will still get a length. DL is practically zero next to L. Therefore, L plus DL is as much as just L. Uh, as long as you are, in, uh, as you are uh, uh, talking about differential uh, values. Now, the formula, it, it happens actually because, I mean, <laughs> If I take, if you take a look at this, where's that ruler? Uh, there are very few substances that actually, when I when I stretch, you will see uh, the uh, substantial change in uh, in length. Well, I'm making this ruler longer. Can you see that? Can you see that it's longer? Who can see that it's longer? Nobody can see that it's longer. Okay. Can you see that it's shorter now? You cannot see that it's shorter, but since I ap apply forces over there, I know that it has to stretch and, and uh, uh, either stretch or uh, get get compressed. So its length uh, changes. So uh, in many practical situations, uh, the integrations is in so narrow limits that we can. Oh, why is it going back? then we can approximate this relation even for finite forces or for real forces. So rather than thinking about a tiny force applied to the, uh, to the end, we can, uh, we can think about a f uh, uh, force applied to that, uh, to that end. Uh, so, and then we will have change in length, finite change of length rather than differential change of length. This formula, you have to recognize that this formula is approximate and it is not applicable to a situation in which that the delta L is large. Well, can you think about an object for which delta L is going to be large? Or a substance? Rubber band, correct. You cannot use this formula for rubber band. You could use this formula for rubber band only if you stretch it by, by tiny, uh, tiny amount. All right. So this type of stress is called tension. Opposite to tension is uh, compression. Um, and uh, compression is also referred sometimes as uniaxial, uh, uniaxial pressure. And it happens when, rather than stretching the object, we squeeze it. So the forces are... Uh, uh, applied in the uh, opposite direction. But from the mathematical point of view, there is not much difference uh, 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 from, the previous, uh, from, from the previous relationship. I already took, it, uh, took uh, that approximate uh, form of, uh, of that uh, formula. So rather than having differential forces, I have Uh, finite forces. And, uh, well, the difference will be now that the component of uh, stress will require that I take minus that value of the force and the same thing with component of strain. It gets shorter, so I have to put that minus over here. Uh, in the result, you, you can recognize that the formula is uh, identical 
to the previous formula. Uh, so the non-zero component of compressive uh, stress is called uniaxial pressure, and uh, we use this value. We write that pressure is equal to the zz component of. Oh, this is the component along the the direction of the force, and uh, by definition, it's the amount of force per unit area of that cross section. Um, I'm not sure if I rem if I yeah I think that I. Uh, introduce the unit of uh, of uh, stress in in all of them notice that uh, uh, we divide force per area on which the force is applied no matter if it is perpendicular or parallel to the to the surface so all stress components are measured in uh, newtons per meter square in SI unit system which means that, uh, well, and we call this unit a Pascal. So all components of stress are measured in Pascals, and pressure is, uh, is a special case of a stress. Pressure, uh, uh, uniaxial pressure, right now we are talking just about uniaxial pressure, uh, occurs when the force, when, when the object or substance is squeezed along a particular direction. Uh, and the unit of uniaxial pressure is also Pascal. Well, we can also have a situation in which uh, we uh, <coughs> create a stress which is called hydrost hydrostatic pressure. And hydrostatic pressure, I mean, hydrostatic actually gives certain, certain hint where it is created, where? In water, correct, or in general, in all liquids. In liquids, uh, <coughs> uh, it is difficult to create shearing stresses. Uh, all, all the stresses are all, uh, all uniaxial pressure. You cannot create uniaxial pressure in liquid either. Uh, only hydro or fluid. Only hydrostatic pressure can be created. And hydrostatic pressure is a stress which is caused by squeezing the substance from all, all sides equally. So you have to imagine now, if you, dif if you consider this differential cube, it has to be squeezed from all directions with the, same, uh, with the same force. If we have such a situation, then uh, we will get the hydrostatic pressure inside of that, of that object. Well, in other words, it is that XX component, ZZ component, and YY component of stress are all equal. Uh, all right. Now, uh, Hooke's law, uh, in case of, uh, of uh, hydrostatic pressure, rather than, than relating it to a uh, linear dimension, it relates to a volume. Um, and uh, we say that the <coughs> change in pressure is proportional to relative change in, uh, in volume. The coefficient B is not called mo uh, Young's, mo sorry, uh, Young's modulus, but it is called still modulus. It is referred to as bulk modulus. Uh, and actually, uh, if we wanted, we could relate uh, bulk modulus just to uh, I mean, to, to Young's modulus as well. But for, for fluids, this one is more convenient because uh, fluids is not maintaining its shape. So uh, it always assumes the shape of a, of, a, uh, of a container. And if we change the shape of the container, it will be too hard to figure out which way, uh, the, I mean, why the volume changed. I mean, we could imagine situations in which we can apply force only in one direction, like in syringe, for example. All right. Now, the last case of, of uh, stress is a shear stress. And shear stress occurs when the uh, force is applied tangentially to the, uh, to the wall. So if I consider this rod, if I apply a force sideways, then 
shear stress is going to be created inside. Yeah, because now think about, let's come back to our object. So this object, and now let's say I'm pushing the, bot the top uh, pen to the right and the bottom, I mean to your left, and the bottom pen to your right, like that. Now, how, the, how come that the cup, I mean, why the pens, uh, pen actually doesn't move away? Well, because so on the bottom uh, uh, pen, I am applying force this way, which means that the pen has to apply force that way, right? So, so the cup applies this way, which means that, that the bottom pen pushes the bottom surface of the cup to your right. Now with this one, uh, the top pen pushes the top uh, surface of the cup to your left. Right? So in the cup, I create a shearing stress. Uh, <coughs> Shearing stress, I mean, you use shearing stress qu quite uh, often. Uh, th try to think, I mean, <laughs> have you heard about a device or instrument referred to as shears? What are they? Scissors. Scissors. Now, talk to each other why they are called shears. And they are called shears be because of Shearing stress. Where is that shearing stress? Talk to each other. Where that shearing stress occurs? Now think about cutting a piece of paper, right? This is, this is how a front view of, the, of, of scissors, right? So now uh, one blade pushes it up, one blade pushes it down. And in this slice over here, a huge shearing stress is created. It is so huge that it exceeds the limit the, the maximum value of a shear which paper can sustain. And you make a nice, a nice cut. Uh, now, uh, uh, how about if you cut a carrot? Not with scissors, obviously. Yeah, in kitchen, actually, we use a lot of this theory. You, we don't think about it. Now, but now think about how, how we cut carrot. What, what do we use to cut carrots? Knives, correct. Now, how do, how do we do it? <laughs> well, the blade gets in like that. What kind of stress is created in the carrot? Talk to each other. So actually when the blade when the blade gets in, right, what does it do to this surface? It pushes it to the left. And this one? And this one is pushed to the right. Correct. How come that it doesn't fly away? Because at the bottom they are connected over here. Right? This piece, this slice of the carrot holds these two pieces together. So how these two pieces interact with that slice? They stretch it, correct. That piece is being stretched, right? This piece balances that force, right? And balances this force, 
right? So, which means that the piece, that the two uh, sides stretch that piece as well, following Newton's second law, uh, third law, sorry. Uh, <coughs> well, which means that this part of the carrot pushes the slide in this direction, this part of the carrot pulls the uh, slice in this direction. What kind of stress is created there? We, have, we just have discussed it. Which one? Tension. Tension, correct. It's a tensile stress. That part is being stretched and, and uh, the theory of cutting carrots says that, that we have to create a stress which exceeds the strength of the carrot. The carrot cannot hold such a strong uh, stress. All right, let's now go back to the shear stress and formally define that. So, uh, let's say that I introduce this uh, 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 coordinate system. So, which components of stress are non-zero? Consistently with this drawing. Uh, y component is incorrect. Remember that components of stress have two subscripts. Not YY. Not XX. Not ZZ. YZ. <laughs> All right. The force is in Y direction and it's exerted on the Z wall. <laughs> right. Correct. <coughs> The coefficient now which relates a shearing stress with shearing strain is called shear modulus. Uh, now, if we take a look, well, again, uh, shearing uh, stress by definition is the force applied to each of those walls, or magnitude of the force applied to each of the walls divided by the area of that wall. Now, shearing uh, strain actually has another geometrical uh, uh, meaning because, uh, well, according to the definition, I have to take the displace this displacement over this length. Right, so this displacement over this length give me shearing strain. Uh, however, this is certain trigonometrical function of a certain angle. Can you can you see that? If I divide this displacement by this height. It will be tangent, tangent of this angle over here. Correct. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> uh, shearing strain refer refers actually to change in orientation uh, in the in the uh, substance. Um, okay. Uh, I'd like now to to have a certain discussion with you um, about, well, from related to engineering. Um, I really like uh, uh, the, the problem which is solved in the, in the book uh, about finding out interaction of a dam with water inside. Uh, but before, before I do this, uh, <coughs> Actually, I will leave the calculations for, uh, for, for, for as, a, your, uh, uh, as an exercise for you. I just want a general discussion about it, why we build dams like we do. Uh, because <coughs> here are some suggestions of building a dam. Uh, so let's say that, it's a, that I will have water on the left-hand side and then, and then a dam. Um, well, I can build it like that and have water here. Or I could build it like that. I mean, that one will be kind of cool. I mean, nobody built one like that yet. Um, I could build a, a dam like that. This one will be also cool, I think. Uh, or how about if I build it like that? Uh, that's enough. So one, two, three, four. <coughs> Uh, as engineers, which one would you, which, uh, which design would you choose? 
uh, talk to each other. Yeah, so have a, have a conversation and then we will vote for it. <laughs> uh, so, who, who would vote for this then? I mean, let's say that we are building it on Colorado River, ne somewhere below Hoover's Dam. Uh, who would vote for that one? I mean, can you imagine how exciting it would be to stand here? <laughs> uh, how about that one? Uh, uh, that one. Oh yeah, there is a lot of you who vote for that one. Now I know why you're doing it, because you saw a lot of dams like that, including Hoover Dam. Uh, but uh, uh, why, why did you choose it? Now consult with each other and tell me what's, what's the advantage of this dam. And what you have to do is you have to recognize that it's built from a certain material which has a particular limits for the strain it can sustain. And what happens with the strain that, uh, really affects how we design those dams. Yeah, so why that, for, start, let's start with this, why, why it is okay that it's uh, narrower here and wh wider there at the bottom? What does it make, I mean, why would we do it that way? There's less shearing stress at the top. Very good. There is less shearing stress at the top. Uh, I mean, first I started to mark it as water, and now I forgot. I, I changed it. Yeah, because now so let's get rid of these. <coughs> and if water is up to that, now think about if I consider this cross section. Well, over here, this water, which is in contact in, with this part. What does it do with, to this piece, JD? It, it is pushing it to the right, correct? Now, how come that it stays in place? Because the dam below, because the dam below pushes it to the... Uh, so how about if I think about the slice? And this, this part pushes it to the left, right? So this slice over here is under shearing stress. And, uh, <coughs> uh, well, we see that the shearing stress over here is determined by the amount of water in contact. So if I consider this uh, slice and the slice a little bit deeper, Now convince me first that the force over here is uh, exerted by this water which is in contact with this piece is greater than with that one. Convince me that this, that this force to the right is greater than this one. It's not, weight is not pushing. Well, I can consider also this fragment. Yes, so... so uh, here I have the same force, right? Now whatever is below, it adds to that force, right? So the force over here on this slice is greater than over there. All right, now concrete or whatever substance we use has a certain, uh, certain maximum uh, shearing stress it can sustain. So if I had everywhere the same thickness of the dam, then the shearing stress would be the highest at the bottom. And actually you can even see that it would linearly change with the, with the depth. Uh, but if we now increase the area of, of this cross-section, also linearly with the depth, then the quotient remains the same. So stress is going to be all over, everywhere uh, the same. And therefore, uh, shearing stress will be now uniformly distributed throughout the, uh, throughout the uh, dam. And 
and the dam will work uh, uh, fine. Well, how about, uh, why don't we then build dams like that? Yeah, so that everywhere it has a thickness the same as at the bottom. This is a very important quest engineering question. Although it has nothing to do with physics. Cost. Cost. Correct. You would have to add that much concrete. Yeah? Or, or uh, and steel. Whatever is, whatever is inside. Yeah, because, because uh, <coughs> Well, they could be reinforced. All right, now I'll give you an example, which actually uh, my sister, who is a civil engineer, actually encountered in her career. Um, she was uh, analyzing a problem in a, which was created in a particular building. Uh, the building had uh, balconies and uh, uh, there's a cross section. It was, I mean, there was an entrance door over here, and just above the entrance door, there was a balcony. Well, and it was designed to be like that. So, uh, well, the owner decided <coughs> that it would improve aesthetics and actually uh, reinforce construction if he puts columns next to the entrance door to support the, uh, the balcony. So he put two columns. Well, in a year, actually, the balcony collapsed. <coughs> and, well, the reason is because it was not designed to have those columns. Uh, can you figure out what was wrong? Well, let me give you some hints. Yeah, because in order to have a balcony like that, uh, we use concrete and steel. Uh, and actually, no matter what, I mean, if you have a, a base uh, for, a, for a building, uh, or even a walkway, when you, when you go sometimes next, uh, within this week, and you see that there is some kind of construction, they will make walkway. You will take a look at that, how they build it. You will see that they will put metal rods in a grid and then pour concrete onto that. Uh, now, <coughs> the reason for it is that concrete is a, very, it's a very good substance for compression. It can sustain huge compressive stress, but it is very poor substance for tensile stress. If you have a block of concrete, it is easy to pull it apart. It breaks. Uh, well, steel on the steel rod actually has an has another property yeah, because steel rod looks like like this ruler, and I mean pull it, and I, we can pull it really hard. Now let's try to push it. See that it's it can I cannot really create a huge uh, uh, compressive stress over here. Well, so what we do is concrete cannot take tension. Steel can do it. Steel cannot take compression. Concrete do it. So if we combine those two, we have a perfect material, which can take stress, compressive stress, and tensile stress. Uh, all right. So let's say that if you design it, uh, let's get rid of this barrier. It's too complicated. If you design a balcony, uh, uh, just hanging, hanging out. Well, obviously there is a, there is a, a shearing stress. So if I consider if I consider this plane over here, there will be shearing stress. But there is also a, a tensile and compressive stress because now, if you look at this part over here, you can recognize well the center of gravity is somewhere there. So gravity also exerts a torque about, let's say, this point. Well, how that torque is balanced? Okay. 
I mean, we, ha we, ha we have already discussed even that. Yes? Yeah, why this one doesn't flip like that? If there's a gravitational torque. Yeah, if I do it, if I try to support it like that, it turns. Have you noticed that? And yeah, why it doesn't turn? Now. Or even better, over there. Uh, well, the other part has to exert a torque which balances this one. Yes, a gravitational torque is in, which means that this part has to apply torque that way. Now, how to apply torque that way? Well, it has to pull here and push there, right? Uh, so if you consider now this slice over here, what happens at the top? The top is being stretched, stretched or compressed? Stretched. stretched. How about the bottom? Compressed. compressed, right? All right, so how would you now put the steel rods into that? Horizontal, which way? Uh, where? At the bottom or at the top or throughout the entire volume? You could put them throughout the entire volume to make sure you will just charge the owner more for it, for the balcony. And he will probably pick another contractor. At the top, because the top is being stretched. Actually, the middle is, uh, middle is under no stress. This is under no stress. So actually, if you run, for example, cables in the attic, uh, how the holes are drilled in the beams exactly in the middle because making a hole in the middle does not weaken the beam uh, doing it up or down weakens the beam all right yes yeah, so over here we would put rods if we were designing a free balcony we would put rods at the top <coughs> now think what will happen if you put a column over here uh, well which means that you push it up on this side all right, that's it for today then. You think about it and why don't we tell me the answer tomorrow.